And today we'll talk about registration number verification. Let's say your um, TSD diploma is a product that really works. It doesn't just compile without errors. It runs and it actually solves the problem. The people in the committee who evaluate your work are so impressed that they're willing to, to turn it into a real product and sell it and make you rich. And this brings you to one problem, um, making sure people only use the program if they paid for it and they got a serial number. So, and imagine you're not planning to make it open source and free as in freedom and just give it away to make the world better. You want to make the world better, but uh, get paid for it too. Not to say that you cannot get paid for free open source software, but that's already too far from where we started. So did anyone ever set up a program that requires a registration number? Yeah. So at least once in your lifetime you set up Windows and you had to input a license key, which of course you got from the compact disk that you legally purchased from your local software store. <laughs> yeah, here in Moldova we have a lot of Microsoft stores. <laughs> and <laughs> so you you know what I mean when I say registration number, license key, verification number, etc. It's some um, a string of digits. Sometimes they are separated by dashes. Uh, sometimes you have to put them into several edit boxes. You know why software makers usually give you uh, separate edit boxes? So it's to make it more difficult for those who use a key again. Uh, so they have to do one, two, three, four copy-paste operations instead of... Yeah, but what else, what else does it give you as a benefit? Maybe it's easier to read the code? It's easier to read and easier to make corrections. So if you have a long string of digits and you made a mistake somewhere here, then you have to uh, manually you know, count which one you got wrong. But you, when you have it split into several tuples like this, then you know that, well, I made a mistake in this one, so that's where you look. Um, you also, probably, when you were doing research, uh, stumbled upon the fact that a lot of software can be installed and you can keep it on your machine even if you didn't pay for this number. It happens from time to time, of course, not to us, but we've read about it in, in newspapers and on web forums. How does that happen? Why does that happen? Okay, so. <laughs> Some of my friends told me it's key gen. <laughs> so a key gen or a key gen is a key generator. Usually it's accompanied by very nice music, old school <laughs> synthesizer music. Uh, what else is there besides a key gen? A crack. What else? <laughs> well, a crack and a patch. Sometimes they already give you a patched executable. Yeah. 
Yeah, it could be a patched executable or a patched DLL or a bunch ah, or a bunch of files you have to replace. And so uh, let's let's compare them. If and let's say another example, somebody on the forum they just posted the key. You have one, two, three, four options to install your favorite game. Uh, which one do you prefer? Uh, so, uh -huh. so the key is the safest one. Why? Because it's a legal way to install it. You just have key. Because you get the program itself from the website of the company that made it. You know it's authentic. And you just give it some data, and it unlocks, and you're happy. Yeah. But you raise your hand. Uh -huh. If you use this, this, or that, then you have to run a third-party program on your computer, which besides patching the software or generating a number might set up a backdoor, create a user with admin rights, create some files, send your my documents folder to someone's email box. Bad things happen. So whenever you have to run some untrusted software on a system, you are probably making a mistake. That's why you should use a university computer <laughs> to run the key again, get the number, and then use copy and paste to to register the program. <laughs> of course, you can use a virtual machine too, but it's not fun. Then the the admins of the university will run out of uh, jobs if you don't use these computers for something. <laughs> Uh -huh. This is a great idea, by the way. Yeah. This will be a challenge for um, So when you run the crack, what it does is it patches the program by um, looking at the... So if you disassemble an executable, did you already have your course about Unitate Centrale de Calculatoire? Equipamento periferico. Okay, so you know a few things about assembly code. So let's say if you look in the code of your program written in some higher level language, like C, for example, at some point it has to compare uh, a string. Oh, let me put it in another way. Uh, let's say you have a function called verify, which takes this license key at the input. So you run this function, and let's put it in this way. If this doesn't work, then you show a message box saying uh, you have to buy the program, the number is incorrect. And then you, let's see. You close the main function, it returns, and that's it. But if the number is right, it doesn't go inside the if, it keeps going and the program actually runs. So this is the piece of code that's responsible for taking the decision. Do I let you use the program or do I quit before you can do anything? Now if you disassemble this, then at some point among the tens of thousands of lines of assembly code, there will be a place where there is an instruction such as jump if this thing is zero and you give it an address where to go to. 
Well, in this, ca in this case, let's say verify returns zero if it's okay, and it returns non-zero if it's not okay. So, if it's zero, we go here, and if it's one, we go here. And there is an instruction that says jump if this thing is zero, and it jumps to the address where this code begins. Um, there are several things you can do. You can either change the, so the, the easiest thing to do is to change this uh, jump if zero to jump if not zero. So then you give it a, a wrong number. You give it a wrong registration number. This function will return not zero as we agreed, it returns one if you go in the if, and if it returns zero, you go here. So you give it a wrong number, it will then, uh, in, in the original instructions, you had jump if zero, to address so and so. And it would go right here. But if you change that to this, then given an incorrect registration number, it will jump to this address if it's not zero. So basically, in this case, you can patch the program by changing this instruction into this one. So, well, in some cases it has to be the other way around because they designed this verify function to return zero if it's a wrong number and one if it's a good number and so on. But the point is that it all boils down to one place where you have to say, do this instead of that. And that's what, uh, what a crack does. It takes the normal executable program, it knows at which offset in that binary file it has to make a change from this to that, then it rewrites the file with the change and you're done. So that's what a crack or a patch will do. And if you get a patched executable, then it's the same as someone else running the patch for you and this, then just giving you the output. So that's what this does. Of course, remember that besides making just this change in the program, they can add more instructions to it. They can make it do more than just one change. And like I told you, it could open a backdoor, it could create a new user account, etc. Now let's think about this. How does a key again work? Well, think about it in general terms. Yeah, but if you have uh, a specific formula that uh, key, key was generated, mm -hmm. try to say it to... Oh, no, there is an algorithm. So, whenever the company that makes the software produces one of these numbers, they just run a program and press something like generate 1,000 numbers. They press the button, it thinks, and it gives you a list of 1,000 numbers. Those numbers are generated in accordance with an algorithm. Yeah? So is it actually the same algorithm used by the majority of companies? Well, we'll get to that shortly. Okay. So, uh, there is an algorithm. that produces a number by following some pattern. And let's say that this pseudocode describes the algorithm. Now, inside this verify function, how does it verify if the number is right? It needs to know the algorithm. 
the same algorithm. Because otherwise, you would have to hard code all the good one, all the numbers into the program, and it would just look them up in a list. But that's not what happens. What happens is that this function uses the same algorithm to verify if a number follows, if a number was generated by following these rules or not. Now, that also implies the fact that if I can reverse engineer this function, so I take the executable program, I disassemble it, and I look at a lot of lines of assembly code. I look at that, and let's say I'm really qualified and I love assembly code and I'm really skilled at it, then I can rebuild that pseudocode by looking at the binary. Of course, it's not a trivial challenge. Depending on, it, of course, depends on how complex the algorithm is. But the point is that it's, in principle, doable. All you need is just enough time and knowledge of assembly code, where to look in order to figure out which algorithm is followed by this function to tell you that the number is right or not. And that's what a key again does. It's a little program that knows the algorithm, and each time you press a button, it generates yet another number by following these instructions. Of course, this implies when you make a key again, you also have to be an artist. Because, you know, all that nice music, animated text, you have to have skills for that too. Um, so that's what a key again does. Now, my next question is, um, what should it be? Do you think, so when you have to choose between a patch and a key again, what will your choice be? Patch. Someone said patch and someone said key again. It was a key patch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a key patch. Uh, by the way, uh, you know the word patch also is the thing you put on the eye. And I, I, um, you probably know that pirates usually yeah. wear an eye patch, even if they don't have a bad eye. No. Do you know why they did that? Yeah, because, yeah. because, because when you go somewhere inside the ship and there is no sunshine, you have to quickly be able to adjust to darkness. Yeah, they the so they take off the patch and they get instant <laughs> night vision mode. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what they wrote on the internet. <laughs> if we can find at least two different URLs stating the same thing, then it must be true. Um, why did someone say that a patch is better? So who said, yeah, why a patch? Because it's easier. It's easier for the end user. You don't have to copy paste. Yes, copy paste and Uh -huh. uh, it's, uh, each block uh, updates and you don't have the pain of getting the license key is valid or get some update. Mm -hmm. So the patch does modify the original exact. Um, so yeah. you don't know if that modification could actually ruin future. Yeah, the problem is that whenever you run a patch, you run untrusted yeah. code. It makes changes to the program which you are not aware of. Of course, it might remove the registration number verification procedure, but it can also add other stuff like a keylogger. So that's why I would never use a patch if there were a key again available. But now my next question is, did you ever run into a situation when a key again was not available for a program you hypothetically wanted to set up? Every time. Huh? Every time. Every time. <laughs> you have no program to set up. 
why is that the case? Do you, why do you think that's the case? Let's say, so one explanation is that uh, the first one you said, yeah. the algorithm is too complicated? too complicated. Okay, so this is complex <laughs> algorithm. The other one is that nobody cares about the program. Not, not popular. Let's say it's a really popular piece of software. In that case, one explanation is that the algorithm is too complex. Well, but, what was you? One more thing would be the type of key gen doesn't exist because it would be useless. So let's say the program authenticates by connecting online to the server. Mm -hmm. so the server can actually verify the through a different method. Uh -huh. Okay, but in that case, the program always requires an internet connection so it can phone home. Yeah. That's the slang term for it. To simplify our context, let's say we never rely on external servers. So getting back to this part, complexity of the algorithm. Imagine, well, you don't have to imagine it. If it was written by a human being, then it can also be understood by another human being of the same level of intelligence or more competent one. So given enough time, a complex algorithm is not going to be complex anymore. If you have infinite dollars, infinite seconds, then it's not a problem. So I'm going to tell you that for certain security mechanisms, it is in principle not possible to produce a key again. So I will say that again. You could have such an approach for registration number verification in your software, which completely removes the possibility of writing a key again. Without relying on external server connections. How do they do that? It's impossible because it's always depends on time that you check the key and find out that it's it's all about time. It's kind of a vague idea, but I guess the way the number is verified would make it so it would be impossible to reconstruct an algorithm out of it. For some reason or for some method, the verification algorithm itself Mm -hmm. would, would be a separate entity from the algorithm, so you can't really do, mm -hmm. use it. But I really don't know how that would work. Well, keep thinking. Maybe the algorithm is using some data from the, each computer that is individual. Uh, so it's somehow tied to the hardware in that specific machine. No, because in that case, you would be able to for example, if you rely on the MAC address, you can just have a driver that says, my MAC address is whatever you want me to say. Yeah. It's not a thing because you cannot change. Does this algorithm rely on the fact that the user cannot see the assembly code? No. You have to assume that the enemy knows everything about your system. But they still can break the algorithm. Yeah. They can even know the algorithm itself. Maybe changing every time the algorithm, having more algorithms. So we, we mm -hmm. assume that they know the algorithm? Yeah. The one that generated the key? Yeah. Then so if it's it's a a case. Case. Uh, hold on. Let's take it one step at a time. Then there should be some data from outside. Should uh, there is no outside data. Some outside no outside information. It's all the decisions and verifications are performed locally. Do you want me to give you some hints? Hints yes. in sure. case. So yeah, my first hint 
is that you can use information from other courses that I teach you <laughs> to answer this question. It's legal to apply all knowledge you have. And Julian already said something. So what do I do? I take uh, a mirror, put it in front of another mirror. This is a bigger mirror, so it's asymmetric. Mm. How does it work? Try to think about this as a computer security challenge. You have to prove to another party that you are really Limited time of access. Uh, wait a second. Say that again, and I will write it on the board. Uh, you mean I wrote the key on one computer, then I used it on another one, and another one? No, no. Uh, you write one time, it's the password, so you know, three times, sort it's false, mm -hmm. and uh, it's false three times, and the program auto-delete itself. Or so, it's like ah. so if I gave it a wrong registration number three times in a row, Um, yeah, this is not going to work because this program has to have a counter somewhere where it keeps track of how many unsuccessful attempts you've had. Have you ever used a program called GameHack? What about Cheatomatic? So let me tell you what they do. Let's say I'm playing StarCraft and at some point I hear, not enough minerals. Not enough minerals. So I gather some minerals. Let's say now I have 413 minerals. I run game hack. I point it to starcraft.exe and I say look for all memory areas that have this value inside of them. And it gives me a list of addresses. Then I go, I make some stuff or, or I spend some minerals. So now I have 351 minerals. Then I go back to GameHack and say, from this list you just found, tell me which ones now contain this number. You do this a couple of times and eventually you know the address where the game keeps this number. And then in GameHack you say, write this value to this address and you won't hear, not enough minerals any longer. <laughs> and when this program says, too many failed attempts. I can just override that number and so. Well, so in that case, let's say they do know the algorithm, but the algorithm uses something extra, like the, the key. Mm -hmm. It makes it unique for that particular set of keys that we, it will generate. So if they don't know the key used in the algorithm, they, they, they can't generate the particular set of keys. Well, you are closer. Yeah, but that would imply that the verify function somehow saves Something similar to that key. Oh, no, 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 it doesn't. You could say a different key. Sure, that's fine, that's fine. Julian has the answer. Maybe the function contains a list of hashes of keys. Mm -hmm. and it's hard to get the key from the hash. But if you have, if you have the key, you give it to the function, it can use the hash and compare it to one. Mm -hmm. Well, it's now, let's say we hard-coded 100 hashes into that executable. And we sold 100 licenses. Now, a few more people downloaded it. They want to pay us. We take the money. We give them a number. But it's not in their program. So we would have to recompile and make sure they download this version and not yeah. that version. So this wouldn't be manageable. So the verify function can't keep any uh, hard-coded numbers? No. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so, if I 
phrased this problem in different words as follows. What would you say? Um, we have the program author and the program itself. And we have a user. This is the user who has the key. So this is the program, this is the author, this is the user. The user has the key. The user has to prove to the program that this key was given to them by the program author. So they gave them the key. Now they give the key to the program. The program has to ensure that this thing is something that really came from this person and not from a key again or some Nostradamus-like mechanism that generates keys. So time I can change the time on my computer anytime I want. Well, Vlad said something different. Private and public key, so the software will know our public, the author's public key. Mm -hmm. Each key that the author will generate it will encrypt it with the, his private key. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the application will be able to check the correlation from this key and see if they are authentic or not. Yep, that's right. Let's. Uh -huh. Let's describe it here as a series of steps. So I am the author of the program. The author generates a key pair. So we use the same, well, the same Whatever asymmetric cryptography algorithm you know how, how to use, you can use that. So you generate a key pair. It has a public and a private key. Now, you then generate some random stream of bytes then you choose a piece like some constant well choose a constant uh, choose a a constant Then you encrypt with your private key this random bunch of bytes concatenated with this constant. This constant could be a string like blah blah. This plus isn't mathematical addition, it's concatenation. This? No, it's an E. It's not a euro sign, it's just an E. For now. Uh, this, the result of this operation, let's call it X. It will be the crypto. 
because it contains some bytes that are not really mapped to Archie symbols, you might want to base64 encode this x. And this is your key. This is what you give to your customer. Now, I am going to ask you to tell me what happens inside the verify function. How does it know that this number is authentic? So, uh, one thing is that the public key yeah. that corresponds to this private key has to be embedded into the executable itself. So, embed public key into the, into the program. So let's say the user types the number into the program. What happens then? You have to take it from here backwards. First of all, you base64 decode it to get that thing. Base64 decode the key. And let's call it x. Then you decrypt this using the public key which you have. And you will get, let's say, Y, something. What happens then? Yeah. Oh. So then you do this. Y ends with blah blah, which was our. Oh, I'm going to write const. If it does end with that constant, then it's a good number. If it doesn't end with that constant, then it's a wrong number. So I could just say return y ends with this. If it does, then you return true. If it doesn't, you return false. This is the verification function logic. Um, yeah? But this application could be fetched, right? Yes. So the point is that anything you could possibly imagine can be patched. Because the only way to prevent people from patching it is to not give them the product. But once they have the program, they can reverse engineer it. <clears throat> they can disassemble it. They can use a network sniffer to see to which server it connects, which packets it's sending, etc. So the moment you give it to them, you have no control over what they will try to do with the program. Any attempt of reverse engineering is out of your control. However, so, so that's why it is in principle not possible to write something which is unpatchable. That's how things work. However, it is possible to write something for which a key again cannot be generated. Why not? Yeah, because this thing relies on asymmetric cryptography. Uh, remember Kirchhoff's law from the se computer security course? What did it say? What did Kirchhoff tell us many years ago? He said that a system can be considered secure if the enemy knows absolutely everything about it except the secret element. And in this case, the secret element is the private key that only the author of the program holds. So if you want to write a key again 
that can break such an approach, you actually have to break this cryptographical challenge. And the problem is that if you do that, then you're much better off just uh, hijacking HTTPS connections and stealing money directly from people's accounts than writing key gems for some piece of software. Uh, the thing is that asymmetric cryptography algorithms are one of the foundation elements on top of which all electronic commerce is based. So for as long as the cryptography itself is reliable, such an approach for registration number verification is not going to fail. Yes, someone can take the program, reverse engineer it, and learn about your constant. They can see what's happening. But unless they have the secret key, or the private key that corresponds to the, to the public key which you embed in the program itself, they cannot do this in principle. So that's why there are some programs for which there are only patches but no key gains. And programs that can be, uh, for which key gains can be generated, I mean, for which key gains can be written, were probably created by people who are not exposed to basic cryptography primitives. Because if they knew about this, they would be able to easily make it happen. Um, this is going to be your next practical assignment for the PSI course. In the lab, I will show you how to use asymmetric cryptography primitives to generate key pairs, how to encrypt something, how to decrypt it, how to verify it, etc. What are your questions for now? Yeah? No, no, no. The algorithm you already have. You just have to implement it. Basically, this is an excuse for you to learn how to use and apply asymmetric cryptography. What? Well, I see where this question is coming from. Um, it's still not for the security course. It's just one example where we apply cryptography. But in this case, we see it as a thing related to distributing software products, not as a okay. thing on security. Why do big companies that Adobe or something doesn't use because there are key gems in the software? Well, there are several explanations. Now, if you have a key that has, let's say, 4,096 bits, um, and when you encrypt something with that key, the crypto is also going to be something big. And registration numbers are usually something that's maybe 20 digits long or 30 digits long. If you use this thing as is, then it will give you a huge crypto. And then when you base 64 encode it, you still have a big string to, to memorize. And maybe because they distribute this on a compact disk where the number is, is written on it, it will be very inhumane to ask people to type this 200 character number into, the, into an edit box. That's why some programs use key files, which is a file you have to give to it. Others don't distribute them on compact disks where the number is printed, but they just send you an email with this whole big thing you, you can paste. So I don't really know why Adobe does it this way, but I'm guessing it's because they want to be able to distribute the software in retail, where you have this box where you open it and you have a little piece of paper with a number written on a compact disk, for example. Maybe that's why. Still, I have to add one other remark. Uh, you can tweak one of these uh, cryptographic primitives that you apply here in such a way that it 
produces a crypto of a shorter length. Then you get numbers that are not very long, still something you can type, but you just sacrifice a little bit of security. Because instead of using a really long key, you use something much shorter. What other questions do you have? Yeah? Uh, no, because it was established before you came that that's not the case. I thought we would, but apparently not. Um, okay, let's think about that. But while we're still recording, let's see if there are any questions related to this. Then we can turn everything off and, and talk about all the business you can't hear about. What other questions do you have about mechanisms? Well, then. Um, yeah, one more last question. Uh -huh. Is this uh, Wednesday? No, because I just gave it to you. It would be non-user friendly yeah. to do that. <laughs>